Hi, welcome to our webinar. My name is Pam Banky, Director of Product Marketing here at Knowledge Lake, and I'll be your host. I'm excited to introduce Gary Smith, Executive Managing Director of Sales at Knowledge Lake. Gary has vast experience in the automation space, helping executives achieve operational excellence through work innovation. Today, Gary's gonna take us through a journey through the transformation landscape of AI and its pivotal role in enhancing customer engagement and operational efficiency across many industries. And also we have Constantine Eck, our senior solutions engineer who will dive into some exciting demos and walk through some unique use cases. But before we begin, a few housekeeping items. This webinar will be recorded and available for viewing at a later date on demand. Also, we encourage your participation, so please feel free to ask questions in the chat window and we'll address them during the Q&A session. Also, there will be a couple of polls during the presentation that will show up in the vote tab below the presentation screen. So get ready to respond to those. Love to hear from you. And with that, I'll pass it over to Gary. Thank you, Pam. I appreciate that. Uh, welcome, everyone, and we're glad you could be here with us this afternoon uh, or this morning, I guess, depending on where you might be based. Uh, as Pam mentioned, I've got uh, uh, quite a background in the what's known as the RPA or the automation world. Uh, I had joined uh, joined that that uh, that charge back in 2015, so I've spent a great deal of time. Uh, working with clients and 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 helping them really achieve a mission in, in automation and and taking work from humans that no longer belong with humans and and putting it into uh, digital or what we call synthetic laborers um, and uh, that is that is uh, really what's what's foremost on our mind to talk with you about today uh, so really when I look at the market and when we as an organization look at the market and consider what we're doing with our clients. Um, there is an existential crisis for work, and this is actually spilling over into an existential crisis for um, corporations, uh, government agencies, uh, everyone out there that, that depends on human labor to drive things forward. Uh, in fact, in, uh, in December, just two short months ago, PwC had released a study, uh, and, and to my knowledge, this is probably the latest of studies of this type that, that I think uh, probably are, are available from myriad different sources. Uh, but the PwC one was the one I was most familiar with most recently. Um, they had interviewed a pretty wide swath of CEOs across the globe, across multiple industries, and uh, 4,207 of them to be specific. And I think what was a little bit startling was this time out, almost half of them, uh, 45%, so call it, let's call it 2000 anyway, uh, expressed deep concern that their organizations would remain viable uh, in the next decade. And that's a pretty stark statement in and of itself. But when, when you dig into the study and start to understand uh, why it is that they make that statement, it, it all associates through the fact that um, they need to change how they're working. Uh, this was expressed in the study. Uh, they need a better handle on uh, the rate of change technologically and what's happening. Um, and, and they also need to understand or they need their people to understand that they at the field level need to be providing innovation to the organization to, to reinvent it and keep it fresh and relevant uh, within customer minds. Interestingly enough, to our view, this all actually comes together. I know they sound like very disparate data points that the CEOs have made, but uh, they're all associated in our mind to work, work product output. So I make that statement because this is really where the conversation goes, right? If we all agree that the organizing principle of, of any company or governmental body or uh, uh, university, whatever, whatever business that you are in, if we all agree that the organizing principle around it is the work product output uh, that is delivered to deliver the mission to the client. Um, and, and I've represented that here with this, this gray circle that you're seeing. Um, we've been basically static since the 1950s 
in, in how we work, right? So this becomes now a discussion of labor as opposed to a technological discussion. Um, of course, technology is in it and, and deeply underpins everything that we all do every single day from our mobile phones and devices that we're using to the computers that we're working on at work uh, to accomplish whatever it is that we're doing. Um, but basically since the 1950s at the advent of the mainframe, things have been viewed through the lens of people, process, and of course, technology, right? And that those three elements have uh, uh, come together to, to actually produce the work product output of a given organization. Problem with that is it's, it's a very um, uh, costly model to scale. Uh, it is intensely human dependent still because it's, it's a, a human centric labor model where humans are actually uh, utilizing the technology to, in a supporting role, that means that people ultimately have the, um, they, they have to check the work, approve the work, right? They're, they're still very much central to everything that's going on. This has resulted, I think, in a work mismatch. When I consider where we are today as a society, we have the, the real world that we all live in, and then we have the virtual world that we live in through our mobile devices or our iPads, whatever it is, right? And that work mismatch has seen a lot of work that could be put into a synthetic labor force being shifted to humans consuming uh, too much of, of, of a human full-time equivalence time. Um, that time is typically spent doing things like finding data from myriad sources across the organization or, or external sources and internal sources. And it hasn't allowed organizations, employees to really keep up with what they're doing. That's why you'll see a lot of studies on great places to work, for example, where people are, are pretty miserable in their job uh, because they're doing things that they really didn't go to university or go to certain training programs for. Uh, you know, I, I think about it in terms of a doctor. No doctor went to medical school and, and went through residency to figure out how to enter a, an appropriate insurance code into a system, right? And And yet, they find a good chunk of their time is spent doing just that. So if, if you know, I guess we'll take a pause here. We got our very first poll question of two poll questions today. Um, uh, we'd be curious to know, is the technological rate of change outpacing your organization's ability to adapt and take advantage of it? In other words, is the thing that's try trying to help you actually hindering you? Um, and I believe, Pam, we have that down in the tab. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. There's a vote tab right under the slides. So please go ahead and uh, start voting. Yeah. And we'll give a few seconds for people to weigh in on that. And then we'll see what the results show. Okay. Um, interestingly, we've got... Absolutely no one said no, which is really encouraging in some ways, because at least you're identifying the problem. About 57% uh, said yes, it is. Uh, technological rate of change is outpacing your ability to adapt and take advantage. And then about 30, uh, oh no, that went up to 62%, sorry. And about 37% said not sure. So that is probably about where we expected the, the poll to be, at least based on the conversations that we have with our, our clients and, and a lot of the uh, organizations that are um, that are inquiring with us. So very interesting because it, it, it does mirror quite a bit of of the, the, the fact that technological rate is, is really kind of uh, diminishing, if you will, a worker's ability to, to really provide and produce real meaningful value to the organization. So, so what does this look like? You know, as, as, as you think about the inability to respond to the technological rate of change and the inability for people to do the higher order work or the higher, what we would call the higher value work, um, what really is is occurring, and, and this is this is reflected, I think, in in the interviews that the CEOs had given with PwC in their study. Uh, there's too much work waste, vast quantities of it, in fact, and this this is creating very disappointing results. Um, that study, in fact, implied a lot of of uh, or not implied, but it exposed a lot of the beliefs that that we as a company have held, which is you have humans doing drone based work. Uh, not drone as in the flying drones, so much as just drone work. 
Um, it's very boring work. It's repetitive. It's mistake prone. Um, and it's really not a great use of, of a, a skilled human worker's time uh, to either the human or to the organization. The answer in the past, right, with that whole, if you think back to the, the initial Venn diagram of people process technology, the initial response has always been throw more humans at the problem. Uh, but that has been revealed to show very diminishing returns and, in fact, gets quickly upside down. Um, and, of course, that doesn't even incorporate what does it? What are the implications from the technological rate of change for things like AI, for example, coming onto the scene? Uh, organizations wanting to lever that for their benefit in improving uh, not only their innovative capabilities in the market relative to their competitors, but to enhance how they're working with their, their customers and improve the customer experience. That's further compounded by the fact that society as a general rule is digitalizing at a much, much faster rate than companies are able to keep up with. And, and what that ultimately results in is when workers are just barely keeping their head above the waterline to deliver the work product that's required to keep the lights on, uh, what often ends up happening is it doesn't give them much time to think about what they're doing competitively, think about new offerings or enhancing and improving existing uh, capabilities or work streams within the company. That becomes a real problem. And, and to that to that point, the CEO sounded off in that uh, that PwC study. Uh, th this is where I think knowledge, like as we look at the world, we see a future is now state of something very, very different. We see an evolved human and synthetic labor organization. So effectively, organizations should be levering an entirely independent, separate source of labor, right? Still manageable, still completely governable by humans. Uh, but it's very different in the sense that, again, if you take that that this gray circle in the middle of the slide as the work product output, it could be for an order entry uh, task. It might be for order to cash in accounting. It could be a contract, um, you know, uh, um, uh, going through a contract and, and, and recording that or recording a deed, whatever that component of work is. Right. What we see that being composed of now is not just people process and technology but synthetic labor being the fourth capability that's added to this. Now, yes, the synthetic labor is technology. We, we do understand that, but it is, it is several elements brought together in our platform that, that incorporate a working, capable, almost sentient worker, if you, if you want to consider it that. Uh, but again, governed completely by, uh, uh, by a human, uh, human oversight. There are a lot of advantages to this. In the modern world that we talked about, where uh, where I mentioned that there's the reality of of that we're living in, and then there's the virtuality of of you know things like our devices and our gaming systems and all of that, uh, that produces more work than probably the real world even does. What this brings together is two different sources of, of the division of labor to the appropriate work stream, right? So you get a different level of quality in a lot of those drone-based processes that you probably have that make up the workflows in your company. Quality is greatly improved because it's done the same way every single time when a synthetic laborer is doing that, that work. Uh, so there's a consistent element, there's a consistent customer experience that comes out of that that's, that's very much improved. There's also a reliability in, in the work that's being done in the sense that it's generally very, very, very mistake free. Uh, and it's and, and again, because of the consistency of it being done the same time all the time, uh, that reliability trans, uh, transitions in through the, the entire workflow of the organization. Um, it is also a reliable source of labor. We'll get into that in just a moment. Um, and what that does is that frees up, right? That starts to return time to the human labor. And that human labor then can then be freed up to do the higher value add work or the, the higher order work that the organization or the CEOs were really expressing in that PwC study, right? They're starting to think about the things like, how do I innovate? How do I change things and adapt to the to where we find ourselves now? How do I incorporate AI? And, and there's, there's a whole series of elements underneath that that transition into a very virtuous cycle. Um, mission outcome is something interesting. Um, 
you know, again, if we, you know, if we all agree that the, the organizing principle for any organization is its work product output, um, uh, what's interesting is where we are now does have a precedent in the past. In fact, the very, very distant past or, or somewhat of a distant past. In 1965, a gentleman by the name of General Sam Phillips was brought into, the, into NASA from the United States Air Force. Um, NASA had realized that we could, in fact, put somebody on the moon. The problem we had was organizing all of the work around it and organizing what the mainframe was then putting out and then pulling it together and synthesizing it into one cohesive work unit. They also had all of the problems with the, the just getting them there, right? You had the Saturn V rocket stack, you had the, the, the command module and the lunar lander. All these things had to be brought together. There were 430,000 people working on the program roughly, and they came from everything, government, private industry, universities. It was just a, it was a real mess to try to, to pull that all together. Phillips actually created something of a different work model that I think is probably more indicative of what we view. Uh, and it worked very well. Uh, we, we now know the outcome was we, we landed six missions on the moon um, and, it, and it really talked to a different time of taking uh, the information age and bringing it into the workplace. Uh, the, the other uh, virtuous elements that the, this type of an approach brings is big reductions in cost, right? Your, your costs are realigned. The ratios of, of human effort to output is, is improved greatly. Uh, so your cost structure changes, right? We move more from, more from a CapEx to an OpEx, right, uh, in, in the way that we work. Um, the other thing is you remove a lot of uncertainty. Um, are the people I'm hiring able to do this drone-based work for you know long periods of time without making mistakes? That uncertainty gets removed. Of course, it also gets you off of a lot of the hiring merry-go-round that many of you are probably on. You're constantly looking for new people because your existing people may be getting promoted, they may be moving out of the organization, and, and you get on a very, very unvirtuous cycle of, of hiring and spending probably a disproportionate amount of time keeping the human model staffed, right? And again, that goes against the efficiency of, of uh, what the modern organization should look like. So, you know, if, I, if we think about this and spin it forward, the problems that this or the, the the problems that this resolves, right? If you if you look through the slide and the nice pretty image of of uh, prosperity and 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 peace and harmony, uh, which which is what we're we're trying to imply, humans are moved out of the drone work and into the value creation role. Uh, that allows an enablement of or it enables a, a production of innovation, deeper thinking, better interactions from human to human. Repetitive tasks are are, are moved off to where they belong, which is really in with a synthetic labor source. Uh, the other thing is you're repatriating potentially uh, a lot of a lot of the work that either was outsourced to other firms, maybe offshore in India, maybe near shore, wherever that may have gone, that gets repatriated in. That closes down an expense. Uh, it also ensures the integrity of the work, right? Because it's governed at a much, much more granular level. The other thing is it removes geopolitical and societal instability issues that can occur in different com in different countries, or even just when you think about what coming out of COVID-19, the impact that that had on business, right? Uh, this is a way of insulating against that. Uh, and of course, labor insecurity and labor scarcity. Um, we, we look at this and what we see the very best of our clients doing is creating unparalleled experiences for their customers. Uh, and retaining their best full-time equivalent people because they're changing their role to something that's more in line with what they were expecting and, and hoping it would be. And of course, you're, you're, uh, you're implementing new levels of, of operational excellence. So the, you know, that is the why of Knowledge Lake, if you will, and, and the why of how organizations can adapt to the, the ever-changing landscape, not only of, of, of the technological rate of change, but the work rate of change as, as things have grown. But what's the how, right? It's not, it, it's only important if you can deploy it against what you are looking to do. So just quickly to lead this section off, uh, I have another poll, our final poll question here for you. Um, is your organization considering a synthetic workforce to improve operational efficiency 
keep up with customer demands and innovate uh, to stay ahead of the competition. So again, if you go down to that uh, that vote tab below, you'll be able to um, you'll be able to answer that. Let's see, okay, I'll give it another couple seconds here. Yeah, I see some answers coming in. Uh, again, it's at the bottom under the vote tab. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Pam. Right now we've got, it looks like um, about 50. This is really interesting. No no's on this one. All right, let's give it another, let's call it another five seconds here and then Pam will close the poll out. Yep, I've ended the poll. Okay. Excellent, so yeah, 42% uh, say yes, that's really good. Um, that's that's a bit higher than I would have expected actually. Um, uh, so I'm very heartened by that. Uh, and not sure was 40%, um, it was almost, equal and then um 20 said no okay so we did get some no's that's 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 where i was expecting to i was expecting to see some no's um anyway that's uh th that's very interesting and and probably about in line with with uh with where we see the market just generally i think there isn't a lot of consideration around it right now because i think everything gets talked about in terms of technology and the reality is these things should be talked about in terms of work. It's it's really work product output. Um, whether that worker is silicon based or carbon based, right? It's uh, it's um, it, it almost is irrelevant at this point because of where where we've been able to go. But um, when I think about it, just in its broadest sense, we consider this reworking work, right? And um, it, it's. It's how do I achieve or how does my organization achieve operational innovation and excellence that also changes the sustained long-term value I'm providing to shareholders, to customers, to my employees, right? To all those constituencies that I would consider to be uh, my most important stakeholders. The, our approach to it at Knowledge Lake really focuses on four core areas or four core pillars, if you will. Uh, and to just kind of give a, a sense of overview really quickly, uh, working from upper left uh, in a clockwise fashion, there's the skills-based synthetic worker, <clears throat> right? We call them skills-based because they are imbued with skills as we are, uh, as, as they're being configured. Uh, and they are supported by AI. In fact, you will see intuitive AI is kind of the wrapper around all of these things. We've imbued the entire platform with an adaptive AI, intuitive AI capability. Um, AI document processing, uh, this is our way of ingesting uh, images, ingesting uh, PDFs or documents that have been filled out by hand, perhaps, in, in, in people's handwriting. It's everything that you're bringing in. That is an unstructured world. One of the great failures of the first generation of, of uh, work product automation, or what, what we refer to as RPA, robotic process automation, is that it missed about 80 to 85% of what its capability could have been because it couldn't handle unstructured data. There was no mechanism to go from the unstructured and bring it in as structured data for the, the digital worker to take advantage of it. We don't have that issue uh, within Knowledge Lake. We're taking the unstructured and we structure it so it's usable. Uh, it also, because of the AI that's around our platform, we have a contextual understanding this is really important. So if you're scanning in and you'll see this in, in one of the portions of the demo that Constantine will be taking you through in a moment. One of the things that's so important about that is we understand what a license looks like globally, right? We just understand that we have that notion. We know what a contract looks like. We know what an order form looks like. We know what an invoice looks like. And so there's no need for a human to go in. There's no need for training a model so the model can understand it. We know based on, on, on how we've been uh, philosophically, how we've been designed and architecturally, how we've been, uh, how we've been uh, designed. Um, the adaptive, uh, the, sorry, the content and data management, you may have known it as another name at a different time uh, as ECM, Enterprise Content Management, right? That was a popular term in the, the original .com 1.0. 
But that's an, ex, uh, an extract, transform, and load capability of bringing together myriad systems, internal and external, getting the data in so that we know where a lot of the answers reside by creating almost like a library, if you will, of the data that we're, the data sets that we're, our synthetic workers are working on. Uh, and that is also forms up a governance layer for us. Uh, the orchestration and work component assignment layer comes out of our adaptive workflow, the last area. And again, this is really important because the adaptive workflow is where as we move forward, work will be atomized. Um, I, I'm often, I, I often think about Six Sigma and how it pertains to process excellence as it relates to humans. There needs to be the same thing for a synthetic labor force and joint human work source. This all occurs in the adaptive workflow arena for us, right? So it's very much beyond where we are now, very much next generational. And you can walk or crawl at the pace till you get comfort around that. But there will be a lot more to come coming out of that single area in our future, probably than maybe any of the other areas, because that's really where we see the merge of these labor sources uh, coming together. Uh, so maybe to give a few examples, just so that you're aware of what, what this looks like in, in flight. Um, I've, I've got two here. Uh, one is a global 25 bank. Uh, they had some issues as it related to regulations and, and, and um, upholding regulatory uh, guidance. Uh, they were, uh, sorry, that's the second one. Sorry. The, the first one is the Global 25 Bank, and they have a um, policy where their branch managers interact with their top 5% of their customers. Now, those can be individuals. They can also be uh, businesses. And they need to know them. They, they have a quarterly meeting with each of them, that top 5%, to make suggestions and recommendations, whether it's elections and in, in investments or in lending instruments, or it might be, you know, how to, how to re-swizzle something in a portfolio. Um, and they've done that historically through their entire history. Uh, never worked out like they expected or wanted it to. Um, and in fact, at one point, they realized about 85% of the branch manager's time was being spent just finding the information on that individual within their own systems. And they only were able to put about 15% of their time against actually making recommendations and coming up with information to share during this meeting. They wanted to flip that on its head. So they, they literally put a digital synthetic worker against collating all of the data, bringing it all together, and actually making initial line suggestions of things that they could do. Um, what this resulted in was astounding. Uh, they saw a 27% increase on average for the average relationship, which was huge, right? It was more than a quarter bigger. The thing that, that really shocked them that they weren't aware of right out of the gate, but they were able to piece together over time was they had been experiencing an uplift in new customers, new high value, high net worth individuals. They understood later, it came from referrals from how pleased the, the clients were with this new approach to their relationship management. And so they actually were bringing in net new customers to the bank and, and that was of course taking away from their competitors, uh, which was very, uh, very pleasing to them. The second example, uh, you know, again, at, at very high level was this global wealth management firm, very well known. You, you would know their name if I could share it with you. Um, they were the ones with the regulatory issue. Um, they called it account sweep. Uh, I don't think that's an industry standard term. I just think it was their internal term. But there's a regulation that when someone dies or if um, uh, uh, someone becomes highly incapacitated and can, can no longer manage their own affairs, um, the organization is supposed to be aware of this and freeze the accounts until they get further direction from uh, the estate or the executor managing things. Um, and they weren't able to completely comply with this and it was costing them millions of dollars in fines annually. Um, again, not a huge number. And it sounds like a huge number to us, but the size of this organization, it wasn't that big, but it was enough that it was annoying and they wanted to resolve it. Um, and get out from under the, the, the regulator's um, gaze. Uh, what they ended up doing was um, putting a synthetic workforce against this, uh, and they were able to manage it successfully to the point where they've eliminated the penalties that they were paying. 
uh, the regulators actually came in and considered the way they began managing it um, because it was no longer human dependent. They began to look at it in different markets as very much a best practices based approach. Um, so uh, it changed their whole compliance uh, outlook in, in that arena. Uh, I think with that, probably the best way to see some of what I was just describing is to see what I was just describing uh, through a, a demo from, from uh, Constantine. Constantine, I will turn things over to you. Great. Thank you, Gary. Let me share my screen here. Perfect. Okay. So uh, obviously there's a whole lot that was covered and there's a whole lot that the platform does. And to be mindful of the time we have, I, I've chosen the use case to walk you through kind of the journey of here's what touches a lot of the platform does and adds value across the board. So really what I try to do is, is use the use case of whether it's customer onboarding, client onboarding, um, you know, new hire onboarding, but the onboarding process that involves multiple touch points and traditionally a lot of, of human effort to whether it's emails or phone calls or, or follow-ups uh, and see how we can streamline that potentially by leveraging some of this intuitive AI workflow part of it and the synthetic labor to be able to say, we know what the process needs to look like. Now let's walk the your client's client into, into, this, into this journey uh, to, to get them on board. So, you know, obviously for the more traditional folks that still like the feel of, of, you know, pen and paper at their hands, we can solve for that as well. And I'll, I'll show you what that looks like um, at the end as well. But, you know, the traditional ways of capture are obviously all still here to be able to, to scan paper or upload documents or, or monitor email inboxes or, or folders, all of that's still here, but we are seeing a change where, uh, we want to enable self-service. So what we have here is the ability to start a workflow uh, without a document or without paper, just with data. So what you're seeing here is a form. Um, and this form could be either uh, could be publicly facing. So let's say on your website, they can they're going where they normally go or on some portal they normally go to. There's a form embedded and the user is able to fill out their information. And I'll use my email here so you could see it actually come to the inbox that I have access to right now. Uh, these questions are, are completely customizable, but let's say I wanna open a new account when I'm banking with, with Knowledge Lake, it's a checking account for my personal use. I'm gonna go ahead and complete this and it's gonna say, okay, based on the information that was just provided, the workflow starts, meaning that no user was involved from, from your side of things. You let the, uh, the client or the prospect self-service to a degree and start a process of let's get everybody involved in, in this process, get them going and launch it without any, any user uh, intervention as opposed to them having to pick up a phone call and call and ask questions. And then you have to send them documentations or emails. So what this looks like to the user that just submitted is they will get an email. Uh, the email will look something like this, where hello, Joe sample in this case. Um, this is obviously entirely customizable as well, but thank you for your interest in banking with Knowledge Lake. Use this link to log in and register and then check back in the portal for, um, for status and for progress. When they click on the link, they're taken to a screen and just to continue that, that a level of self-service for one is, um, they can sign in, they can register. There's no need for you guys to get involved. And the portal itself will be completely white labeled with whatever logos or background images or color schemes that are, are need to be met by your marketing requirements. I can log in, sign in, and every step of the way I saw on the previous page, there was a forgot password. So once again, we're trying not to add additional requirements and overhead to your technical teams. This is a self-service environment. For security purposes, every time I log in or a user logs in, they're prompted for a one-time code that gets sent to the email they registered with. So let me grab that real quick. And as you go through the process, here's the task to just assign. Once again, to note, um, it is white labeled with the color scheme of, in this case, Knowledge Lake, um, based on the request that they set. So this would be a, a personal account or checking, or if it's gonna be for investment account, this information in the middle can change depending on the request. 
and now I can go ahead and kind of guide my my clients through through the way that I want to ingest documents. So hopefully make it easier for them and make it easier for me along the process. So I'll grab my driver's license, an account application. Oh, it's the wrong application. Let me delete that one. There we go. Application. I'll grab a, a pay stub. And let's say I need a check to validate the current bank and then go from there. So I have my information here. I have the preview of it. I can change stuff as you saw. And I'll press complete. The task is done. So now this goes back into, um, into my workflow that goes along with it without the user being involved. They could check here and see where they are in the status. Um, once again, this is part of that self-service point of view to where instead of inundating your, your folks with incoming calls or emails, hey, I submitted this application a week ago or two days ago, where am I in the process? As things move through the workflow process, whether a user is involved or not, um, the person that submitted, in this case, the application can always log back in and see where they are in the status and the process as they move along. So I'm going to jump back over to, to Knowledge Lake. So really, um, the part that I'm about to show you here, this is more informational for you folks. Um, this is the validation step that is if I need to get a user involved for validation. And in this case, I could see all these documents, they were um, they, they match what they were. So back to Gary's point of contextual understanding, we recognize that, yep, this is a driver's license. Let's pick out the information that's important to us. Here's the account application. Let's pick off the application so far and so forth, so on. So in a production environment, this step is fully automated. Um, there is no reason for users to get involved unless something happens where, let's say I have a requirement where the date of birth has to be, um, you know, a certain age in order to, for this to be valid. Then I can flag it as an exception or if something's missing, I can flag it as an exception. Otherwise, this will be going straight through to the process without any user um, intervention here whatsoever. So the reason I paused here, and I actually go back to the dry license first. So, so to Gary's point, we didn't have to train it on every possible variation of driver's licenses. Um, it recognized that it's a driver's license, and based on what I told was important to me, it picked off the information automatically from what it found on here. So that's a huge benefit of, of being able to get to production faster. So as you kind of scale this across the organization, um, it's a lot quicker time to production as opposed to trying to build a custom model for every possible use case you're trying to have. With this document, uh, this is something that I just printed out. I, I hand wrote it myself and I scanned it back in. You can see the quality is not great. The printer's running out of ink. Uh, the, you know, it's not, not, not a great copy of it. However, the AI was able to still read it, understand my handwriting, and it is my handwriting. If you have any comments, you can add those as well, uh, and pick off the information once again without any user intervention. So it goes across the different pages, grabs the information that's needed, and goes through this whole process. So whether it's machine printed, handwritten, we're able to capture the information that is important to us. Uh, with this pay stub, you know, what I wanted to show here is that you could do more than simply pick off values on a document, right? Somewhere along the process, some decisions need to be made. So one of the benefits of leveraging AI is to be able to ask a question. So I have a field here called uh, most recent pay stub. And when I created this, I said, I give it a hint to say most recent to me or to my organization means it has to be within two weeks of the pay date. To, to validate it is indeed the most recent. Um, and obviously in this case, it is not the most recent because 2017, so it didn't flag it as true. So I could use this for routing purposes to be able to maybe start another portal task for the, for the client or route it to somebody else for manual review um, and go from there. So this is really kind of getting to the point where, yes, there is a structure to it, but if you needed to make decisions based on you know, some situations that are may not be found explicitly with data labels, here's a great way of doing that. So here's a, uh, a dummy check. We're able to extract the information off that, including the handwriting as well. And here, you know, for stuff like the, the first name, last name, the legal amount, um, you know, there's not necessarily data labels everywhere, 
but it understands what this information is on these different documents and gives me the values that I need without having to get a user get involved. Um, at this point, as things get approved, the status bar within the portal gets progressed and so forth and so on. And then really depending on what the, the business needs are, um, you are able to continue the workflow and say, you know, just to show you how robust it can be potentially where things start from a form or from a document, they go through a process, they create task portals, portal tasks for your users, um, goes into this AI step to perform the uh, contextual understanding, data extraction, provides a validation step. So all the work that typically needs to be done, as you can see, it's still being done. We're just finding a way to automate that so the knowledge worker can spend more time doing what drives the most amount of uh, value to the organization, uh, loop things around as needed, and ultimately send the documents where they belong, or send an email perhaps saying, you know, welcome to the Knowledge Lake team, or, you know, sorry, your application was rejected, whatever that process may be, but automate this entire process so it still has that personal touch of passing parameters. So here's your name, here's your information, but making it more autonomous. And if I want to take this a step further and say, once this is done, maybe call my line of business application via an API call, or pass this along to some database, or start an RPA or an automation to do something else for me, all this could be seamlessly integrated into the workflow. So once again, not eliminate the work, but distribute it in a way to where users have more time in their day back to focus on more valuable things as opposed to things like data entry or key from image. Um, you know, I, I would love to have some questions in the chat of, as we go along, but I want to stop here. I feel like this is a good point attrition back to Gary to kind of sum these things up without overwhelming you with too much information. So Gary? Yeah, thank you, Constantine. That was that was wonderful. I hope uh, hope everybody enjoyed seeing that. Um, yeah, so I, I guess there's a couple things, uh, um, you know, the, the how to get started. So we have uh, specifically for this webinar, we've created um, five spots in a no charge proof of concept. Uh, so please uh, sign up and fill out the form. And basically what we'll be doing, it's not first come, it's not first apply. It's it's uh, it's based predominantly upon interest of of uh, or depth of of uh, what I will call a use case. I don't like the term use case, but a, on a workload that you're considering uh, for automation. Um, you know, maybe to sum up too, just briefly here. Um, I guess when I look at things, the the key points is the takeaways. Again, we're not really. Yes, it's a technically enabled capability, but it's not the discussion was really around the workflow, right? How do you change the work to a different uh, source of labor? In this case, a synthetic pool of labor as as you saw Constantine demonstrating and and how you manage that and how that uh, how that gets deployed. Um, we've we've thought about extremely carefully and and really put into place something that's very, very easy to use with, as little code as, as you could possibly imagine, and in many cases, obviously, being no code. Um, you know, again, we're also looking toward where the future of work is going at the at the atomization level, right? How do you take work, break it down to its its smallest components, and pack that over, dispatch that over to either humans or to the uh, synthetic source of labor, so that new division of labor, if you will. Um, and uh, I think that is it, Pam. Do we want to go to any of the questions? I'm hoping we have some. Yes. Thank you guys so much. This was really informative and we do have some questions. So just a reminder, please uh, put those questions into the question box below. Um, here's one, I think, Gary, that is really relevant to what you spoke about in terms of uh, how work is done. Uh, from Ryan. So Ryan wants to know, do you foresee a swing cycle in the change? For example, we hired during COVID. Nope, we're in layoff, transform to non-human swing. And then we'll see us go back the other way in 24 months. Yeah, it, Ryan, that's a great question. I think the way that we've been seeing it is that that whole hire layoff cycle uh, that continues to perpetuate, a lot of it's because the there there has only been a dependence on, on human-centered labor to deliver things. Um, I think the cycles, maybe the frequency of them will shorten, or, or, or sorry, the frequency of them will elongate over time. Um, that there will be a better match and appropriation of work to 
individuals, humans, uh, and then the things that get parsed off to to synthetic labor, um, it will will keep a little bit more of a stability in the in the higher higher layoff cycle that we we see all too often. That's a great question. Thank you for that one. That 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 one's near and dear to my heart. Yes, that was great. Uh, let's see. We've got another one here. Um, what do you see? What do you see the best organizations do? What steps taken when implementing a synthetic workforce? Yeah, that's a that's another really good question. I'll uh, Constantine. I'll have you chime in if uh, if I miss anything that you want to add to, please. Um, I guess leading off, the, what the best organizations traditionally have done, and I've been at this now for going on uh, nine years. Uh, the first thing is, is they have an executive sponsor in the C-suite. Um, I know that this may sound counterintuitive or outside the, the purview of the question, but I get where the, the person asking it is going. This is effectively something that's an executive mandate on how the organization delivers its, its work product output value. Um, so we see a, an executive sponsor always somewhere from the C-suite. Um, typically they aren't looking at this as a technological exercise. They are literally lo looking at it as a work output exercise. And they're trying to change the, um, they're trying to change the ratio of work so that humans are freed up to do the higher value order work that only humans can do, right? Things like creativity, imagination, judgment, uh, working with other humans, resolving issues that humans may have. Those are things that a synthetic laborer just won't do that well. Uh, the other thing that we see the best organizations doing is, is they're not looking at this as a point in time automation of a sub process. They are literally trying to take out entire tranches of end to end work. Uh, that is hugely meaningful because what they're the results they're seeing are much deeper and much broader. So it gives a much clearer indication of, of the C-suite and the board. Hey, this isn't like a passing fancy. This is a necessity for work going forward. As much as you're going to have to deploy an AI capability in your organization to survive, you're going to need a synthetic labor source to survive, right? It's an existential question. Uh, those right off the top of my head will be the items that I would see as kind of the, the, the core characteristics of, of great programs. Constantine, did I miss anything? Is there anything you wanted to add? No, I think you summarized it really, really well, Gary. Great, great. Great. Uh, we have another question that I think uh, Constantine will take. Uh, what about AI mistakes in reading the information slash data? We can expect it to work 100% every time. We can't expect it to work 100% every time. Would this not need human oversight as a control? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. And you're right. It's it's definitely not going to be 100%. I think anybody who tells you it is, is you know selling snake oil at that point. Um, <laughs> So yeah, there's a couple of ways that we handle that depending on, on what's available and depending on the kind of information you're extracting. So if it's, uh, you know, my when I architect these solutions, my preference is always to say, well, is there a database somewhere organization that has the answer key, right? So if I'm trying to deal with a new uh, a client or, or, or a patient or, or something else or an invoice or whatever it may be, uh, do I have a correct answer somewhere in line where I could say, if I extract the name of, of Gary Smith, does Gary Smith exist in my database that I can validate the information that I extracted from this document match to what I have in my database? So I think that's probably my first preference is yes, let's let's not ex assume 100%, even though you know there's two things at play. There's the actual data extraction, the text layer of it, and there's the decision that the AI makes. And sometimes the AI becomes smarter than the text layer and it fixes some of those mistakes and gives you the correct answer, even if the text isn't quite there. Um, but the fallback is human intervention, absolutely. And, but even in that case, if I need a user to review something, if I have, in my example of the license, I think it was like 10 fields, I think it's a lot faster for a user to do quality control and say, these 10 fields match what I see in front of me, as opposed to having to do a uh, key from image on those 10 fields. So, you know, in, in, in summary, yes, not 100%, best way to do it would be either validate against a data set that you have or have a user uh, spend a fraction of their time doing validation as opposed to key from image. Great. 
Uh, just a reminder, keep sending those questions in. We've got another one that is kind of related to the one you answered earlier, Gary. Uh, this one is, how do I introduce synthetic workforce without scaring my human employees? Yeah, yeah, that's a big, and th this does come back, you're right, Pam, it ties a bit to executive mandate, right? It's, um, th there's two things. I think once people, uh, it's communicated that there will be an improvement really to their role by taking a lot of the robotic work out of the work they're doing, putting it where it belongs most appropriately. And then of course, uh, that will result, um, you know, in all cases that we've seen, better, just a better job. Um, I think if it's communicated very much in a consistent message from executives that, you know, this is how it lays out, this is your role, your role not only is in, as important as it ever was, it's, in, it's increasing in its importance so that we remain relevant over the next decade, as opposed to the fear that a lot of the CEOs have. Great. Uh, let's see, let me take one more look here. I think there's one more question, um, also somewhat related to one earlier on security, but um, as a cloud native platform, how do you ensure security and prevent data breaches? Sure, I'll, I'll chime in. So uh, the server I have running underneath my table is protected by my, no. Uh, so yeah, so very, it's a very good question. Absolutely. Uh, we do leverage the Microsoft ecosystem for a lot of this part of it, right? So it's not our, it's not a server room we have somewhere that's trying to run this. We are leveraging the best in breed to be able to say, let's, let's run in a fully vetted environment, architected in a way where it's a bunch of microservices that aren't necessarily codependent. So things can have rolling greens and, and as things go up and down and scale, um, security is top of mind. We are SOC 2 type 2 compliant. Uh, we, we are HIPAA compliant. Uh, we have you know no exceptions in our SOC 2 for the thing last three years running. So we do take it very seriously. Our The platform is entirely uh, single tenant. So there is no comm commingling of, of data. There's even no commingling of, of resources. So as we as we scale to accommodate your workloads and, and dynamically build more workers to accommodate that, the moment that job is done, the worker gets destroyed, doesn't get passed along to the next clients that use it for their services. So we do take it very seriously. Um, we do third party pen testing as well. So it is it is top of mind for us. And, and I encourage anybody that is interested, we do have um, our, our CTO who is very capable and very willing to meet with our clients and and kind of go through a lot deeper dive of a process to make sure that those those um, those questions are answered in a, in a way that makes makes you feel comfortable. Great, thanks, Constantine. And um, it looks like that's all for the questions right now. Um, any parting words, Gary? No, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, hopefully, it was beneficial to you and, and gives you a deeper perspective on, on where we see the world changing. Thank you all. And don't forget to fill out the uh, link in the attachments for the free POC to be considered for that. Thank you everyone for your time today and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Take care.